G'day everyone, I'm going to give you a, a whirlwind tour of Pegos and some of the cool stuff uh, we've built on top of IPFS. So what is Pegos? It's a global peer-to-peer -peer private file system and application protocol designed for the average person to use safely. Uh, it, it's a file system, so everything has a unique human readable path, which begins with your username. You can share individual files or folders, read-only, writable, constant time sharing with, with a group, or, or revocation. So the usernames are unique. How do we do that? So you need a PKI. Uh, this is basically just a mapping from username to a list of uh, signed claims. Uh, and each claim is essentially two public keys. You have your identity public key and your home server public key. That's an IPFS node ID. Uh, this is uh, slightly more secure than DIDs because, in the general case, because uh, with, with DIDs you can have DNS leaking into it via the service endpoints, which are URLs, so we avoid that via the, the home server node ID. Uh, this is all stored in a champ, which is a compressed hash array mapped prefix try, which is a super cool data structure. It plays well with CIDTs. Uh, it's in insertion order independent, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and so for the, for the PKI, the only consensus we actually need uh, is just time ordering, so if two people can't claim the same username. Um, but yeah, you get efficient lookup, uh, comparison, and merge. And all this champ data is mirrored on, on every instance. Uh, and so you get private local search if you're trying to connect with a new friend, um, which is super important for something that's social. And once you've got your identity of the person whose data you're trying to get or log in or whatever from the PKI, what do you do next? You need to get a mutable pointer. So in, a, in our case, a mutable pointer is a mapping from a public key to a signed pair of CIDs. And how, how, do, you, how do you get this? So with a peer-to-peer -peer RPC call, so this is just standard HTTP calls over peer-to-peer -peer streams. And this is, I think this is an undersold feature of IPFS, which is amazing, uh, because you can totally avoid any dependency on DNS or the TLS certificate authorities. You just say, I want to dial this node by public key and send whatever you want. Um, and yeah, so yeah, it's awesome. So this, this gives us fast retrieval, uh, fast remote updates, uh, but you could still fall back to IPNS, to actual IPNS if uh, for, for a slower read backup if your server was offline or for, for whatever reason. And so this is the, the, the basic architecture. Pegos uh, installs and runs uh, an IPFS instance uh, itself. Uh, I've just mentioned it's, it's DNS-free and trustless. And so if Alice logs in on, on one instance uh, and tries to modify something, so Alice has a home server, as we mentioned, uh, all those writes get proxied over a peer-to-peer -peer stream and so the data ends up initially on, on, on the, the, the home server. So with a file system, especially a social one, you need access control. So we, we do that with a thing called Cryptree Plus. You, you, you've heard Cryptree several times today already. So uh, let's say, what, what, what does the plus mean? So well, Cryptree itself is, uh, was invented in 2008. Um, so we've, we've added a bunch of things on top of that, that initial version. Uh, including metadata privacy, ciphertext privacy, and made it post-quantum. So it's pure capabilities, so you don't need to rely on a server to enforce access control. It's fine-grained. It's also stored in a champ. We like champs. Uh, the ciphertext access control is a relatively new thing. That's as of January this year. Uh, we do that with uh, things called block access tokens, or BATs, which I'll talk more about later. And another super cool thing that we get is zero I.O. seeking. So if you have a huge file, I don't know, like gigabytes, maybe even terabytes, it's encrypted, but you want to you wanna be able to seek to somewhere down there really quickly. You've got the start of the file, say. How do, how do you do that? Like obviously, if you encrypt the, the entire file at once, you would have to download the entire file and decrypt it, which is not going to work. So, I mean, the first part of that is, is you chunk the file, obviously, and you, but each chunk is independently encrypted. So you can get whichever bit you want uh, to decrypt it. But the other, the other key thing is 
uh, how you get from the location of the first chunk to the location of some later chunk. And that's this, this zero I.O. thing, um, which if you want to hear more about, just talk to me later. Um, and a, as you'd expect with IPFS, you get efficient modification. So if I modify a byte of a terabyte file, I don't have to re-encrypt and upload the whole thing. So this is how it looks. You've got your internal champ nodes. It's going to work. Oh, yeah, it worked. And then you have a, the crypt tree node for, for each chunk of your file or directory. Uh, and that can have uh, links to the, the encrypted file fragments. And so the, the keys in this champ are basically random. Um, subsequent keys in a file are not random, but they're still not deducible uh, by the server. So the storage, your home server can't figure out or can't link the different chunks of the same file. So we use that to, to hide the, the size of the file, among, among other ways. The read crypt tree is pretty simple. It's, it's been discussed earlier, but yeah, it's a tree of symmetric keys. If you have one key, you can follow the, the, the arrows, follow the links. Uh, it also gives everything a well-defined path. So if I just give you access to this file, you can follow the parent links to get the names. So you have a path, but you still can't see if there are any other files in that directory any siblings or anything like that. The right crypt tree is even simpler. Uh, so there's just one key for each file or directory. Uh, these are all symmetric keys, by the way, uh, in the previous slide. Um, also, the, the top ones are symmetric keys. These are obviously key pairs at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and the, the metadata we protect, uh, file names, uh, file name sizes, if you care about that. Uh, the file sizes I've mentioned, so the, the chunking part gets you down to modulo 5 meg. Uh, we also pad pre-encryption to a multiple of 4K, so you, you end up with 5 meg over 4K, or 1,280 possible chunk sizes in the entire world. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, the, the IPLD format for Cryptree uh, that we use makes files and directories indistinguishable. So you can't, the server can't tell what's a file, what's a directory, or who has access, or even the directory topology. So this is how the CryptTree format looks like. So this is the, the CryptTree node itself. This is a DAG Seabor node. Um, and there's basically three independently encrypted bits. Uh, the first two are quite small, and they're to do with more with the, the structure of the CryptTree. And this is actual data, like children if it's a directory, or or the data of the file itself. And there are these, these bats, these things that I keep mentioning. Um, and yeah, minor optimization. That, so you know, everything here is padded as well, which you mentioned. Um, but if a file or directory, which most directories are, is, uh, is under 4K, we just we inline it so you don't have to do any other network requests. <clears throat> so back to bats. What, what is a bat? Uh, so, yeah, the, the important point here is you shouldn't be relying just on encryption for privacy. If you make your ciphertext public, that matters in a whole bunch of threat models. Um, so with, with the BATS, we've, we've got a, a post-quantum access control at the block level in IPFS. It's, again, pure capability-based. Uh, and the cool thing, it, it manages to maintain the auto-scaling properties of IPFS. So in IPFS, you know, if one node retrieves a block, it can then help to serve it up. It, and the way we've done it is, is the, same, the same thing. They can help to serve it up and continue to apply the same auth to it. And what, it, what actually is a bat, so a bat is just 32 random bytes. The, the auth we use over, over libpeer-to-peer is uh, S3v4 signatures which are time-limited, tied to the source, uh, the source IPFS node making the request. Uh, that means that we, can, we don't have to worry about these auth tokens. You can just broadcast them to the DHT. There's no, there's no such thing as a replay attack. Uh, and this whole auth token in, 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 with a signature and its wrapping is 89 bytes, so about two and a half CIDs. And we, we have one of those for every, not every block. Some blocks are still public, but the ones that actually have ciphertext in them. Uh, so it's quite a low overhead. But of course, you need a modified bit swap to, to be able to handle this. So we've added, yeah, bit swap, which sends this, this auth string. Uh, 
you can you can see it there um, as a URL. One super important thing, which uh, which I kind of just mentioned, is you need to check any any scheme you use. You need to check it against the actual uh, the source node ID coming to BitSwap, uh, which made the request. Uh, and we use this in a thing called IPFS Nucleus, which is a super stripped down uh, IPFS implementation that has all the stuff we need. Um, it basically just has the block API. So we call it an IPL daemon. And yeah, you can see that those are all the API calls we have, as well as obviously the, the peer to peer HTTP, HTTP proxy. And this IPFS nucleus thing has a, has a, a customizable block allow API. So this is a thing that BitSwap hooks into. And this is a function signature, basically. So you have allow, it passes in the CID, the actual data of the block, uh, the source node ID, and then the all string it received over the, over the network. And that just returns whether or not BitSwap should release this block. So again, you can check out IPFS nucleus if you want. And there are there two, two things I haven't had time to talk about, um, which is uh, a GC implementation. We have a fully concurrent GC, which so you might have, might have noticed that there's no, there's no pin API here. So we, we, don't, we don't actually have a pin API. Uh, pins are, are, are implicit for us, um, from the, basically from the mutable pointers. And so the GC just grabs the mutable pointers, and you've got an implicit pin set, and you can proceed from there. And the other thing is, uh, well, I'll talk about this tomorrow in another talk, is we're, we've just released an application sandbox, which lets you run private applications over private data in an untrusted way so that the application, if it was malicious, couldn't steal your data or exfiltrate it. So, yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, come find me. <laughs>